even long. Today, I want to talk about uh, the British economy in the Conservative years, 51 to 64. I thought I'd kick off with a series of luxury like, cliches or accusations even. 13 wasted years, failing to fix the roof while the sun shone. The British disease, national decline. In economic terms, national decline means relative decline, because in fact, yeah, this is a period of economic growth. People were better off. But it was probably a period in which there were underlying economic problems that were not fixed. So the question is, what caused the British disease? What did the government do or fail to do about it? What could they have done differently? Again, you could say the other way, was Mr. Butskill to blame? Or, in the circumstances at the time, did we have Butskillism? Because basically, we liked it. You know, we're British. We want a quiet life. Actually, whatever did happen to the British who liked a quiet life? I don't seem to spot them anymore. I think we should actually begin with an emotional point, almost. I mean, what's wrong with a quiet life and a bit of comfort for a people emerging from the 30s? Hitler, a long war, the Blitz, austerity, under Labour. No, do you remember Hector? Have you seen this before? Yeah, welcome home, Hector. Right, coming home from the war, and there's Mrs. Hector, and there's little Hector. Well, you know, don't you kind of think that Hector, Mrs. Hector, and little Hector, or well, maybe they deserve something. Maybe the world didn't owe them a living, but maybe it could give them something. Maybe they've kind of earned it. The problem was... The world was changing, and maybe Britain wasn't quite in step with those changes. So to do that, we need to look at some of the underlying realities of the British economy in this period, and of the world economy. And the fact to realise is, you know, it was major changes. Now, it's not a basic point. If you were Hector, not Hector, sorry, little Hector, the wee lad, right? He's at kind of almost the start of the baby boom, as we call it, or me, the end of the baby boom. You are a lucky person because we're pretty much, I think, the luckiest generation thus far to have been born around. I think that's actually probably basically true. And the root of that luck is actually, of course, the old joke I always used that the Germans changed their national sport from invading France um, or other countries to um, selling us BMWs, Bosches, and being us at penalties, i.e., the years from the war to the 70s are kind of years of unbroken peace, prosperity, democracy, better health, wealth, health and housing, sustained economic growth, a consumer revolution, rising social mobility, the Beatles and the Stones. So why on earth did my generation spend all our time moaning? It's not as if it was all doom and gloom, though. I mean, you know, the economy grew and kept growing. Between 51 and 64, British growth rates were at around 2.3%. Historically, that's actually not bad at all. However, in the same period, the Italians grew at 5.6, the Germans 5.1, and the French 4.3. In fact, as many of you know, in the Western world, only one economy did worse, Ireland. And believe me, the Irish economy in the 50s was a basket case, and a pretty cruddy basket it was at that. Maybe handmade by a folksy craftsman, but cruddy all the same. So why was Britain underperforming? Well, one explanation of that was its economic orientation, if you like, was somewhat askew. You know, Britain had always seen itself as an imperial global power. It was an imperial global power before the Second World War. And in many ways, it economically, it saw itself as global Britain. Where have we heard that before? Not a problem, except that in the world, post-war world, the growth was less global than what we might call first world. That's what we used to call it years ago. For the economists amongst you, the terms of trade was changing. Gosh, that's exciting, isn't it? What it means really is there's money in them our hills, but those hills were in North America and Western Europe, maybe Japan after a while. And the money was in cars and washing machines and TVs. Now, Britain's export industries were kind of slightly differently orientated. Yes, they produced those things, but were often geared to selling them to Commonwealth and other economies. And the problem is those economies were mostly primary producers and they just weren't as well off. I mean, they sold raw materials and stuff and food. And the real money being in consumer goods was actually in first world markets, especially Western Europe. And Britain wasn't necessarily aiming at them in the same way. Additionally to that... 
cheaper, less profitable exports made you less money. And, let's face it, the West Germans and the Japanese were about to get rather good at selling Beamers and Toyotas. And of course, in 1957, the French and the Germans and their chums combined to create a customs union. You know, you might have heard of it. It's called the EEC. And those economies grew very quickly after the EEC's creation in 57. Then there was the issue of defence. The Korean War saw a really big hike in defence expenditure. And it was to remain high. And Britain's determination to be a nuclear power would help that as well. Um, if you look at the Britain of the 50s and early 60s, it's got troops deployed across much of the world. That saw Britain spend a lot more on defence than its European competitors and invest a lot more in defence. Now, I always say in many ways, defence is a kind of private industry in terms of ownership, but the nationalised ones in terms of consumption, in terms of demand. So in many ways, for private investors, defence was a safer bet than, say, the car industry. Yeah, 63 to 64, you've read in Lynch, you know, 34.5% of Britain's research and development went on defence, 10% of West Germany's. Then there was British industry. Um, famously, you know, the British industry is depicted in these years as something of a basket case, and there's justice in that, by the way. Some of you will know, oh, yeah, i tell you the story later on, but I want to start a strike. Blame is often heaped on over-mighty trade unions. There is some justice in this, you know, asking for inflationary wage prices, which create what we call a wage price spiral, you know, so wages go up, which puts the cost of industry up, so costs, so prices go up, so prices go up, so I want higher wages, so blah, 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 blah. Unions are also blamed for obstructing innovation, you know, especially in working methods, new machinery, etc. And in truth, there's some that was, was the case. But often this was actually not because of the strength of union leaderships, because of their weakness, which often led to their members having the upper hand, and particularly bolshie shop stewards. And the famous workplace show of hands, you know, that was how you chose to go on strike or not. And basically, you know, if you put the pressure, if you're not putting your hand up with all the others, you're not really one of the chaps, are you? Then, um, this is personified, by the way, in Bit of film I'm stick at the end of the clips of one of my favourite films, which is called I Am All Right, Jack. It's a, from the early 60s, a British film, Bolting Brothers movie. And the figure in that is Fred Kite, who's literally a Bolshevik shop steward. He's a communist. And brilliantly played by Peter Sellers, by the way. And the joke is in I'm All Right, Jack, that he's basically an idiot. His boss, played by Terry Thomas, who's major, is also no less of an idiot. And what happens is this young, enthusiastic time and motion study man comes in, played by Ian Carmichael, and they start to think of ways in which this firm might become more efficient. What that leads to is a massive strike, and nothing changes. It's a brilliant film, um, as well as one that gives interesting thoughts as to how one might have sexual congress in a bubble car. In the end, in the right joke, nothing changes, and both sides are quite happy with it. And that tells a little truth about British management as well and British ownership. Like the unions, they were actually pretty resistant to innovation, often pretty resistant to changing the way they worked the new product, to higher end product, and to trying to sell to new markets. And then, of course, where it comes to strikes, politicians like to quiet life, so why don't you settle, little chap? Even on whose terms, as Churchill once said about the bus drivers, on theirs, cock, on theirs. But meanwhile, we were better off. Yeah, real wages rose by 4% in the early 60s, for example. And people felt better off, and frankly, it won the Conservatives' elections. You were talking yesterday about Supermax big win in 59, surrounded by all these happy consumer goods. A consumer boom helped by rising wages a housing boom and easier access to credit meant people could buy a lot more stuff. Now, productivity didn't grow while the, and, and while the economy grew, as we know, it grew far less quickly than other countries. But And in addition to that, higher real wages and higher consumption meant higher exports, no, higher imports, sorry, not exports, higher imports. And then it also meant inflation. The Korean War brought a sharp spike in inflation. It was up to 9% by 1951. But by later standards, Inflation actually remained relatively low. There was a spike in 55, 56, about 5%, not helped by Red Butler, something I'll talk about next time. And 
it would begin to peak a little bit again in the early 60s. But generally speaking, you know, inflation wasn't so much of a problem as it would be later on. I think the truth is, McMillan flagged up inflation as a problem, you remember, in the you've never had it so good speech, but that's about as far as he went. He wasn't prepared actually to do much about it. And both of his chancellors who did try to tackle it, Thornycroft to Selwood Lloyd, ended up out on their ear, though for different reasons, as we will see. Again, by the standards of earlier years, the 30s or later years, the 70s and 80s, you know, inflation, I mean, inflation was okay, um, okay, and so was unemployment. However, it did rise in the late 50s, peaking at about 600 odd thousand, and then spiked big time in 1962, 878,000. So they're not big figures for us these days, but at the time, the, fo- the figure of a million unemployed was seen as you know, a, a thing you must not have. You must never get to a million unemployed. And it spooked Macmillan big time. To be fair, Macmillan had cut his political teeth in the 30s. He'd been the member for Stockton on Tees. He'd seen the impact of unemployment at first hand. He'd written in the 30s his book, The Middle Way, was a critique of the Baldwin and Chamberlain government's policies, if you like, saying gut states should intervene more to bring down unemployment. So he had, you know, he had genuine political um, dislike of unemployment, horror of it even. But we've got to be blunt about it as well. You know, it was also political in the sense of it was going to cost him votes. Perhaps the most worrying little sign about the unemployment of 62 was it was rising at the same time as inflation, which was a 4.3%. Um, it's the first little signs, I think, of a phenomenon that will come to trouble Britain hugely in the 70s and more in the 60s as well, which is called stagflation, where you get rising unemployment, a stagnant economy alongside inflation at the same time. Then there was the issue of sterling. Under the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, Bretton Woods is a place in New Hampshire. Of course, you hold a conference in New Hampshire. You, know, you never hold it as a no vote in Scunthorpe or in trailer trash in Arkansas. In the leafy woods of New Hampshire, John Maynard Keynes, among others, had accepted a system the Americans wanted to introduce of what were pretty much fixed exchange rates. It also gives us the IMF and the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, for those of you who know about that. And it also saw the pound pegged to the dollar. The dollar effectively becomes the world's reserve currency in Bretton Woods. Now, that meant we've got fixed exchange rates. Now, they've been fixed too high, and as you remember, the pound was devalued in 49. That did cost Labour dear politically, I think. But again, the Korean War, and then rising imports that went with it, put pressure on the balance of payments and on sterling again, and indeed a couple of cynical electioneering budgets wouldn't help, i.e. sterling crises were going to be a problem through these years, and we'll finish by rounding that up. Central to all of this was an argument about how viable Keynesianism was or not. Keynes envisaged governments using the levers they have at their disposal to manage the level of demand in an economy. Now, in such a way, it was going to give you economic growth, full employment, but without the high inflation. Now, there were kind of three kinds of levers, actually. We'll forget the first ones because there were quite a lot of those in these days, and they were basically controls. So in the war, there'd been price controls, wage controls, rent controls there were as well. Um, rationing was kept going until 54 to some extent. Um, there were powers available to restrict the availability of credit and to restrict control imports. There were subsidies for bread, for example, which is a kind of reverse control, isn't it? However, the most important levers that Keynes envisaged using what we call fiscal policy, and monetary policy. So fiscal policy, right, means basically government spending and taxation. Monetary policy means the Bank of England manipulating its base rate, the interest rates, to try and control the economy, and a thing called the money supply that we're not going to worry about now. That's to come. If the economy is undercooked, what you can do is use your levers to give it a boost, to give it a leg up, if you like, what we call the injection of demand. You can cut interest rates, you can cut taxes or you can raise spending, fund that by borrowing, and that will inject demand into the economy. If the economy is overheating, policy needs to be what we call deflationary. OK, and that means you put interest rates up, you cut spending, you raise, you cut spending, and you raise taxes, thus sucking demand out of the economy. It's called demand management, or well, the shorthand for it is stop go. We're going to use stop go because it's nice and easy. So when you want to deflate the economy, you stop. When you want to get the economy growing, you go. In the hands of some kind of disinterested technocratic treasury that just wants to get Keynes's equilibrium bang on, it might well work. 
The problem was it wasn't in the hands of a disinterested treasury. It was in the hands of a very, very interested chancellor and an equally interested prime ministers. Those years saw some famously political budgets. Now, political budget is a euphemism for um, cynical pre-election bribery in this period. Rab Butler did it in 55, Heathcote Amory in 59, and Reggie Maudling for pretty much all of 62 to 64. We'll come to these again more fully in short. Now, you could make a joke in a sense. You could say, he who goes usually goes for broke. And that's how it worked here. So Butler goes in early 55. At the end of 55, he has to stop with an emergency budget. Selwyn Lloyd had to stop in 1960. And when Jim Callaghan inherited, um, really, a bit of a mess of the economy from Reggie Maudling in 64, he had to stop big time. And then after much stalling in 67, he actually had to devalue sterling. Cut the value of sterling against the dollar. And the problem with goes was that they tended to cause sterling crises. In 51, a sterling crisis was caused by rising inflation in Korea. And this saw the Treasury try to bounce um, Red Butler, new chancellor, into leaving Bretton Woods, letting, the plan was called Robot, and it would have let sterling float, which is a euphemism, frankly, for letting sterling fall, let it sink. And to stop markets attacking the pound further, therefore, devaluation always requires deflation. It requires a deflationary economic policy, a stop. As it was, Robot was killed off, but Butler had to introduce serious measures to deflation in 1952. And we said before, after 55, he had to stop again. Now, this was partly because there was another run on sterling. Stop time once again because sterling was causing problems. 56, Suez, another sterling crisis. 57, saw another the arguments about how tough the stop had to be led to Peter Thornycroft, the Chancellor, resigning in 1958, along with the rest of his team, by the way. After the pre-election go of 55, a major run on sterling, or well, 59, sorry, a major run on sterling, so Britain have to borrow $1.5 billion from the IMF in 1961. As they always do, the IMF get their pound of flesh in the form of a sharply deflationary policy. The following year, Selwyn Lloyd lost his job in the light of the night of the long rise. Reggie Maudling's dash for growth will undermine sterling again. And the need to shore up sterling as well as try and stop things led to interest rates doing like this, but often actually being pretty high historically. 7% under Thornycroft, for example, and that hits business, hits investment and hits growth. Now, the truth is underneath all of this, of course, with economics, as it always does, laid politics. When Maudlin became Chancellor in 62, is in the teeth of a proper old-fashioned political crisis. You know, perfume and all that were becoming along. Um, Macmillan's position was already seriously weakened. He's 20 points behind in the polls. In 62 and 63, the Conservatives lost seven by-elections. One of them, famously, was lost to the Liberals in the ultra-ultra safe seat of Orpington. The dash for growth, in the end, couldn't save Supermac. He was done for, but it damn near saved the Conservatives. Yeah, in 64, unemployment was back down to half a million, and Wilson had a majority of just four. Hume damn nearly won. Through much of 52 to 54, Gallup, opinion pollsters, had Labour in the lead. In 57 and the first half of 58, Labour had a lead again, and sometimes it was a big lead, up as high as 10% or more at times. In short, good economics often came up against the need for political necessity. And then there's what we call high politics, how chancellors and prime ministers got on. We'll look at more of that next time. But there's a simple fact here. In 13 years, the Conservatives had six chancellors. It's a bit like a holiday job at times. And of those six chancellors, Macmillan had four. So no chancellor is long with his feet under the table, as it were. That's my printer going, by the way. It's exciting, isn't it? Um, said before, the allegation is that the Conservatives failed to fix the roofs while the sun shone. And as I said before, Macmillan understood economics, a rare prime minister in that, and saw there was a problem. There were attempts to change the game. Robot was killed before it was born. Probably wouldn't have worked. Thornycroft walked out. I'm actually not sure simple deflation would have worked very well either. Lloyd, Selwyn Lloyd gave us a pay pause, i.e. pay restraint, but only in the public sector. Private sector pay continued to spike upwards. And productivity remained stalled. 
Selminoid also gave us Neddy and Nicky, who are two lovely chappies. The NEDC, Neddy, the National Economic Development Council, and the National Incomes Commission. Spoiler alert, neither made any difference. Eden have remained aloof from the Messina talks that created the EC. Okay. And when Macmillan applied, de Gaulle said no. In truth, fixing the roof was a bit like hard work. In, yes, Prime Minister, one of my favourite programmes, whatever, um, Hacker, the Prime Minister or Minister before that, wants to do something that um, might be politically sort of unpopular, or actually Hacker, the civil servant doesn't want to do. So Humphrey always says to Hacker, mm, that's courageous, Minister. And Hacker goes, oh, courageous, right? Well, herein lies the problem, I think. After the 30s, a long war, post-austerity, right? And then we've never had it so good, but we like it. Tomorrow could look after itself. For now, I think Dad wants his Morris Minor as a car. Mum wants her mod cons, her washing machine. And daughter wants the latest 45 RPM hit single by Cliff. Less understandable, that one. And Harold wants to win and for that most intelligent but also most political of prime ministers harold Macmillan, i think fixing the roof while the sun shone was just that little bit too courageous have a look at the clips of mine all right jack keep looking through the stuff the material that's on there um it's 13 wasted years of the classic you know the assessing the nature of this government um, next time, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the chancellors that were in this period, because I think that will help us understand some of the problems that there were for economic policy. And then we'll go on and look at British society in the 50s and social policy. And it's a great period, actually. Um, so I'm going to think a little bit more about Bill and Eden and all those guys. We'll do a bit of Suez as well. Anyway, have a great weekend, boys and girls. OK. And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Toodaloo.